Hi, like Melly said, my name is Shay and I'm going to be a second year graduate student at UH Manoa. Um, a little bit about me. I'm born and raised in Hilo on the big island and decided to go to college in a big city, you know, and pursue my career in a master's program and hopefully, you know, make a difference with my research. And when I so thank you all again for um, attending. So, so just like a brief um, inventory on sheep and goat farms and the number um, in 2022 based on the USDA NASS. Um, of course, beef cattle was of first place, right, in the number of farms, followed by aquaculture and other animals. And then here comes sheep and goats with number three, right? So we have in 2022 less than half of the beef cattle number of farms, right? And then moving on to the right, the inventory here, we can see that there's been an increase and a decrease in the past 10, 12 years, but we do have sheep, more sheep and lambs compared to goats. And so my project basically focuses, it has two parts, right? The first part we'll talk about right now is the trace mineral status of locally raised sheep. And so Minerals are very, very important. Like Dr. Page said that they are essential for not only ruminants, but all animals, even us, right? It's essential for their health, their reproduction, their production levels and normal growth. Um, micro minerals are just as important as macro minerals. They're just measured differently. Um, inadequate concentrations can lead to deficiency and toxicity in their body, but then requirements are based on a number of factors, right? Breed, genetics, the why are you raising your sheep, what's the purpose, and like different production stages. And feeds tend to have the most amount of uh, minerals compared to water and other mineral supplements. And the there's a number of factors that um, in, influence the mineral concentration, such as soil pH, right? Um, we tend to have more acidic soils here and so that could lead to deficiency in the forages that are here, as well as the different forages, like de depending on, you know, if you have, what are different, like if, depending on where you live, you'll have different forages, right? That That's one factor. And then the season and climate, the, where you get your water from, and then as well as the atmospheric inputs. And so my research st study focuses part one, on the current status of trace minerals in small ruminants. So our overall goal was to improve the quality of health in small ruminants in Hawaii. And therefore our objectives are to one, evaluate the trace mineral status. And two, which I'll be talking about later is the survey, surveying the management practices of local small ruminant producers. And by doing that, we collected and analyzed samples from sheep, uh, collected those samples from local processing units throughout the islands, focusing on chromium, cobalt, copper, iron, manganese, molybdenum, selenium, and zinc. Uh, we decided to focus on these trace minerals because not say they're more important than the other ones, but the test that we sent our samples to focuses on these specific minerals. And the other way that part relating to part two is that we create a survey for small ruminants, which hopefully all of you participated in and completed, right? If you didn't, it's in the corner right there. You can scan. And so for, we have collect, we have finished collecting all of our samples. We have collected over 80 samples due to funding. We can only collect so much, right? And so here is the preliminary data. Here we can see that we've only, we were only able to collect from two counties, Oahu and the Big Island from five different districts, but a total of 11 ranches and farms. Um, three of those farms participated in both the sample and collection, sample collection and survey, which made it easier to analyze the data, right? And those three did offer mineral supplements to the herd. And so if you look at the table here, we can see that almost all of our uh, samples came back deficient in molybdenum, followed by a uh, deficient in chromium and then uh, cobalt. And here you can see too on the toxic side, there is a small percentage of certain minerals that came back toxic, which is not a big percentage, but still it's still there, right? And then the rest came back normal, which was really good. Moving on. And so here is one farm that was 
that is on the east side of Oahu that we sampled from, we got a total of nine samples. Uh, here we can see that samples came back deficient and toxic. Um, and since they did respond in the um, survey, we they did offer mineral supplements. So that was kind of, you can see that, oh, they give mineral supplements, but they still have deficiency and toxicities. And so they were deficient in, 100% of their samples were deficient in molybdenum, followed by copper and then chromium. And then as well as almost 80% of their samples came back uh, toxic in cobalt, followed by zinc and manganese. And then here are three different farms, all from the big island, from the north side, the west side, and the northeast. Um, you can see a farm B, 100% of the samples came back deficient in molybdenum, and then followed by chromium deficiency, then cobalt and iron. But we it was only 14% of, the four, not 40%, 14, 14 samples. And I believe that this farm had over a thousand um, sheep. And so it's a very small percentage. But since they did not participate in the survey, we don't know if they offered mineral supplements. And as for toxicity, 14% of the samples came back toxic in copper which is kind of um, okay. rare because Hawaii tends to have more copper deficiency, especially in cattle, right? And then moving on to farm C here, you can see it was on the west side, total number of eight samples. And yes, they did offer mineral supplements, but no toxic levels of minerals. However, they did come back almost 80% deficient in molecular. Sure followed by chromium, manganese, and uh, cobalt. And then farm D, here you can have, here you see was on the northeast side, had a total of nine samples, and we don't know if they offered mineral supplements, but they did come back deficient in 100% of their samples in molybdenum, followed by chromium, cobalt, and 10% selenium, and as well as 11% toxicity in manganese, cobalt, and zinc. And so as far as summary, you can see all of our samples were, def mo almost all of our samples were deficient in molybdenum. This could mean that they had internal parasite problems or there was just a lack of molybdenum in the concentration in, or in the diet. And more than half of the samples were deficient in chromium. This could mean that they were stressed, right? Because we did collect from slaughterhouses so they can have elevated chromium levels or they could have a lack of chromium in their diet, right? And almost 40% of samples were deficient in cobalt, which means they could also have a lack of forage, lack of cobalt in their forage and soils. But then again, keep in mind that there are a number of factors that could influence all of this. And we only did take a small percentage of majority of the farms, small samples. <laughs> yeah. And so the take home message is that deficiencies and toxicities are based on a number of factors, like I said before, but not all herd health problems, all herd health issues are mineral related, right? It could be totally other injuries and other stuff. And so each mineral have a minimum and a maximum tolerable, tolerable amount of concentration in their diet. Therefore, the concentrations are not gonna be, always, they're not always gonna be in the perfect range. And then not all operation herd mineral status will be the same, even with similar environmental factors and management factors. It really depends on things that are out of our control sometimes. And so how can producers use this research? Um, they could use, they, they now have an idea of what the current trace mineral status is in the state, and it can provide producers with a guide per se concerning of what the mineral supplements they feed their herd and how, how much do they feed, how often. And then it also encourages to assess your own herd and look for signs of mineral imbalances, right? But then again, not all herd issues are mineral related. And then moving on to part two is the survey that I was pushing for everybody to uh, participate in. And so we looked at, um, sorry, wrong slide. So why do we care about the management practices producers are using? From a research standpoint, we could take this project and 
create more opportunities to further small ruminant research because I think, I believe only me, Taya and Jesus are the only ones doing research right now for small ruminants in Hawaii. And there's not a lot of research done before us. And so I think with all of, all of our projects, this could create more opportunities, right? Open more doors. And this could also better target producers' needs as because, you know, feeds are really, really expensive and account for 70 and 80% of the expenses of your operation. And then you could also improve the health, right, of small ruminants nutritionally. And so for this survey, we focus on five mainly find five different things. Her demographics as to how much sheep or goats do you have? What are the breeds? What are your purpose and whatnot? And then focus on marketing practices as to, for example, if you raise your sheep or goats for meat, where do you sell it to? How do you sell it? How much do you sell it for? And then as well as feed practices as to if your uh, small ruminants are on an all forage diet or do they get mineral supplements? And then moving on to health practices as to, do you do hoof trimming? Do you shear them? Do you deworm them and whatnot? And then reproductive practices is to, if you, for example, bring on rams to your operation or if it's just natural service or if you don't do anything at all. And so some preliminary survey results for her demographics. We did open the survey in February and it was focused on sheep producers only, but we've recently opened up to both sheep and goats. So that's why you see a big difference in the amount of respondents compared to sheep and goats. And as for sheep breeds here, you can see the most amount of the number of ranches. Almost all ranches came back with Dorper for sheep operations, mixed with Barbados and Katahdin, and then as well as some uh, wild and unknown breeds. And then moving on to goats, since we since there's only a little bit amount of producers that have goats only, we only could have we only had a little bit um results that showed Nigerian dwarfs come Nigerians and Nubians coming with the most amount most common goat breeds. And as for the purposes, majority of the respondents said that they do raise their small ruminants for meat followed by breed stocking and then pasture management. And then moving on to the right, as for the meat, people who raise their sheep and goats for meat, majority of them said that they do sell their sheep and goats to family and friends, followed by self-consumption and then on-farm sales. And then as for feed practices, 60% uh, of the respondents said that they do rotational grazing followed by both doing co continuous and rotational grazing, and then 50% only, only continuous grazing. And then the type of feeds that, they, that the respondents said that majority of them do feed mineral supplements, which is good considering that my project focuses on minerals, right? Followed by grasses, forages and stuff, and gra grains. And then majority of the respondents said that they feed their sheep and goats through feeders and field foraging, but almost half of them said that they do strictly all forage diet, yeah. And then as for the average price of a 50 pound bag of grain was $27, and then it was $50 for a 50 pound bag of supplements, which is very, very expensive. I must say, if you have a large herd, that's really, really expensive. And then as for health practices, here you can see that majority of the respondents said that they deworm or do coccidia treatment followed by vaccination and then foot trimming. And then reproductive practices, 10 of the farms and ranches said that they do non-reproductive practices followed by other palpation, other palpation and bagging and then flushing. And so the take home message for that is that each producer will practice different management, right? Best suited for their operation and goals, right? Each operation is gonna have not the same goals, right? And then this project allows researchers to study management practices and it is vital for future small ruminant industries because we want this industry to grow, only grow right here. Yeah. 
And then how can producers utilize this research? Um, they now have an idea of what other producers are practicing on their operation. And if they want to modify or keep the same practices, you know. And then as for the survey, please, if you have not already participate in this, this is your, your um, practices are really, really important for us to know because we want to get an understanding of what people are doing and then that relates back to the trace minerals. Like, if you know that your herd is deficient in something and you fill out this management survey and then you, um, what am I trying to make here? It's like, it goes hand in hand. So if you, oh, if you answer, participate in the survey, you'll know that, oh, you feed your mineral supplements, but you, but you are still deficient in this, but you, you could try something else, right? So please participate, take a picture, scan this QR code. And if you have any questions, you can email me or ask them now. Yeah.